to 1. Now at 10 o'clock, the news with Dan Jordan. Tony Blair is accused of duping the country over Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. But he says there is evidence and promises to make it public. Violent clashes in Geneva as thousands turn out to protest against the G8 summit. And Montoya wins in Monaco, giving Williams a first win there in 20 years. Good evening. Two former cabinet ministers have accused the government of exaggerating the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Robin Cook said ministers made a monumental blunder by going to war and he's calling for an independent inquiry into the intelligence which led them to believe Saddam Hussein was a threat. Claire Short went further and claimed Tony Blair had duped the public. The government has rejected the claims, insisting that Saddam did possess weapons of mass destruction and the proof will be made public. Our first report tonight is from John Pienaar, who's with the Prime Minister at the G8 summit in Edian. Tonight, Tony Blair and George Bush looking closer than ever. No surprise there, of course. What's interesting is that a lot of other world leaders seem happy in their company. Mr. Blair's keen to forget old squabbles over Iraq and make people believe that he and his ministers told the truth when they said Saddam Hussein had to be stopped from developing illegal weapons. So it's bad news for the government, but Claire Short saying publicly today she just doesn't believe the official evidence. Where the spin came is the suggestion that it was all weaponized, ready to go, immediately dangerous, likely to get into the hands of Al-Qaeda, and therefore things were very, very urgent. The latest attack from Claire Short is a stinging one. She said President Bush and Tony Blair were determined to go to war all along. The intelligence material was spun, manipulated to make war seem urgent, and to convince the doubters the weapons threat was exaggerated, including a claim Saddam could launch chemical or biological weapons at 45 minutes notice. The UN weapons inspectors couldn't find chemical or biological weapons before the war, and no final proof has been found since, but Mr. Blair's convinced it's there. Even though dossiers of evidence failed to silence the critics before, Mr. Blair said he'd seen more evidence, and next time the doubters would see things his way. I certainly do know some of the stuff that has been already accumulated that is out of interview with the scientists and others, which is not yet public, but what we are going to do is assemble that evidence and present it properly to people. Even while Mr. Blair tries to settle his quarrels abroad, the one at home is getting worse. Tony Blair insists the evidence of Saddam Hussein's weaponry will be found, but he also wants a lot more interviews and investigation. The undeniable proof that Tony Blair wants clearly isn't there yet. John Pienaar, BBC News, Avian. The former Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, has called for an independent inquiry into government claims about weapons of mass destruction. He said that British troops had been sent into battle on the basis of a mistake. It seems so far a fruitless search, but still the attempt to track down evidence of weapons of mass destruction continues, and it's becoming an ever more crucial task, as the Prime Minister's credibility risks further assault. The message from ministers so far, be patient. Will the search reveal things? Yes, I think it will. Will the search be difficult? Also, yes. His doubts over the existence of the weapons drove him to resign from the cabinet. Now Robin Cook says the government made a monumental blunder and should investigate why. I think we now need to have an inquiry that can look into what went wrong in either the gathering intelligence, interpretation of intelligence, or what was said about that intelligence. It's very important for the government's credibility that there is a thorough investigation, because at the moment that credibility does look badly damaged by the inability to find any of the weapons of mass destruction. And more pressure for the Prime Minister, the Liberal Democrats want a parliamentary investigation. This whole issue has now become the devil for so much rumour and discrimination that we must have a wide-ranging inquiry. I think we need a select committee of the House of Commons with the power to see everything and the power to speak to everyone. The government faced two knife-edge votes before the war. Do those MPs who offered support then now feel betrayed? The reason that I voted in favour of the war um, was because Iraq had breached its obligations to disarm. Now, Saddam Hussein could have done that, he chose not to. Um, that was why we went to war. I do think that much of this is pure. It could be a turbulent week here at Westminster. MPs are preparing to question Tony Blair on his return from Evian, and there's growing support for Robin Cook. 
Even the Conservatives who backed the war say an inquiry would be needed if government deceit is proven. Carolyn Quinn, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's talk to John Pienaar, who joins me now from Evian. John, how does Tony Blair plan to take on his critics over the question of weapons of mass destruction? Well, it won't be easy. I think as time goes by and, and more weapons inspectors go into Iraq, there'll be more people who agree with uh, Claire Short and others that Tony Blair is uh, digging hard, putting on a brave face and, and trusting to his luck. But one thing that might help is the sense that world leaders here are trying their best to, make, to let bygones be bygones. And tonight there are just some tentative signs that may be happening. Behind the scenes, in the various delegations, they've been putting together a statement, a joint statement, committing the entire summit to work together uh, to halt the spread of weapons of mass destruction. Now, I think it'll be the sort of statement quite difficult to, to disagree with, but to see world uh, leaders coming together on the very subject that drove them apart may at least create the beginnings of an impression that the leaders here are starting to uh, make the early repairs on the transatlantic alliance that was damaged so badly after the Gulf War. All right, John, thank you very much. The presidents of France and America have had their first meeting since their bitter disagreements over the war in Iraq. Jacques Chirac greeted George Bush at the annual G8 summit of leading industrialized nations in Evian. They'll have detailed face-to-face -face talks tomorrow. From there, James Robbins reports. In a world of insecurity, France has simply closed a string of alpine resorts to protect the world's most powerful. Question for George Bush. How do you handle a summit you'd happily skip, hosted by a French president who defies you over Iraq? Mr. Bush's answer, arrive at the last moment and announce you're leaving early. So both men are a bit tense as they emerge for the crucial handshake, first this year. Just grit, grin and bear it. Neither side is backing down over the war. George Bush has cancelled invites to French troops for joint exercises. Jacques Chirac sticks to his line. Winning a war doesn't make it any more legitimate. Ne croyez pas tout ce que l'on dit. Don't believe everything you've been told, Mr. Chirac insisted. My meeting with President Bush was very positive. Well, maybe, but the coolness does have real consequences. Today's opening session was leaders from Africa and the developing world trying to narrow the gap between rich and poor. Some of it has foundered in this poisoned climate. So sadly, um, Africa's been caught in a crossfire between the disagreement over Iraq, between America and France. And one of the best examples of that is that President Chirac put on the table a deal on trade, which America has basically blocked because it's so annoyed with France on Iraq. It's not all gloom. Russia and the United States have found enough common ground today to repair that crucial relationship. So one chunk of post-war ice has melted. But this summit in the French Alps still risks being as much about sulking as substance. The really critical argument remains this. In a world so dominated by America, how far should or can her allies go beyond disagreement to outright opposition? That's a matter of dispute so big it can't be resolved at a single summit. James Robbins, BBC News, Avion. Away from the summit itself, there have been violent clashes between police and anti-globalisation protesters. Shops were looted and missiles were thrown at police who fired anti-riot pellets and tear gas. Running battles tonight in the very centre of Geneva. Stun grenades fired into the streets. Anti-capitalist protesters and the police fighting road by road for control of the city. The violent confrontation followed a day of frustration. The demonstrators angry they couldn't get close to the G8 summit. Tight security means they're being kept more than 20 miles away. Hundreds of police were brought in to try to disperse the crowd, but at times they seemed to be almost outnumbered. Every time the police thought they'd broken through, we saw the protesters coming back for more. The police are determined to clear this area, but the protesters are equally determined to stay. It could be a long night. And there was more violence in another Swiss city. Protesters in Lausanne tried to storm a hotel being used by G8 delegates. Police fired tear gas into the mob, driving them back for now at least. But the majority here only want to make their point peaceful. Thousands marching towards the G8 to listen to their anti-war, anti-globalisation message. Their main aim in running the world the way they run in the world is purely to profit and not in the interest of us and the rest of the people in the world. But tonight it's violence for which this protest will be remembered. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Geneva.
A 60-year-old woman in Toronto has died of the flu-like illness SARS. A total of 31 people have now been killed by the disease in Canada. Officials are investigating a further five deaths which might be linked to the outbreak. Britain has called on the Burmese authorities to release the human rights activist Aung San Suu Kyi, who was taken into custody after violent clashes on Friday. A number of her supporters have also been arrested, and all universities have been temporarily closed. Two people have been arrested on suspicion of murder following the death of an 18-month-old boy in Essex. The child died at South End General Hospital, where he'd been taken with serious injuries. Britain's first mission to another planet will be launched from Kazakhstan tomorrow. The Beagle 2 robotic probe will travel 250 million miles to Mars. Due to land there in December, it may provide the first conclusive proof of life on the Red Planet. David Chipman reports from the launch site. Next stop, Mars, they hope. The Mars Express is Europe's first venture to another world. A Russian rocket has been hired to launch the mission. If it works, it'll lead to the most comprehensive search so far for life on a neighbouring planet. Tonight, the rocket stood poised for the final countdown tomorrow evening. This white section holds the precious cargo, the spacecraft that will journey for the next six months towards Mars. The rocket's now ready to be fueled tomorrow. The weather looks good, everything's been checked, including the tiny British spacecraft, Beagle 2, tucked away at the top there, designed to land on Mars and look for life. But people are nervous here. Europe has never been so ambitious in space before. And the last time Russia tried to get to Mars, from this site, seven years ago, it all went wrong. This is how it's meant to work. On the approach, Beagle 2 should break away and descend to Mars. Airbags will cushion its landing. The spacecraft may be small, but it carries a wide range of instruments, and with it, huge potential. I never dreamt this would happen when I was a small boy. Uh, when Sputnik left from here, uh, now it's really happening. Europe is going to Mars. We're going to stand the Beagle 2 lander on the surface. I can't tell you how exciting it is to be involved in the whole thing. Many fingers are crossed here tonight. There's no backup. But just imagine if this mission does find evidence of life on Mars. David Chukman, BBC News, at the Baikonur Launch Centre in Kazakhstan. Now with news of a warning for England football fans and the rest of the day's sport with Mary Rose. Mary. Thanks very much, Gary. The England coach Sven Joran Eriksson has told England fans to behave themselves or risk being thrown out of Euro 2004. Speaking two days before England's friendly against Serbia and Montenegro, Eriksson said any trouble could lead to a European ban. The prospect he described as absolutely catastrophic. Sven Joran Eriksson was watching his team very carefully this afternoon as they begin preparations for the friendly against Serbia and Montenegro. But it's not only the players who are on trial. Following these scenes at the Stadium of Light last April, the Football Association have been warned that any repetition could see England thrown out of the European Championship. Because next time something will happen, deadly. We are out. We are out of Europe, and uh, that, uh, that could be absolutely a cat catastrophe uh, for us. So of course, it's very important that we behave uh, on the pitch and that uh, also our supporters can behave. The coach's warning will be reinforced by his captain, David Beckham, who attended an awards ceremony last night with his wife in New York. He won't be playing on Tuesday, but he will still fulfil an important role. Well, the England captain may not be here, but tomorrow he makes a personal plea on television urging all fans to behave. The match against Serbia and Montenegro may be a friendly, but all the footballing authorities will be watching very closely. Chris Holland, BBC News, Leicester. The Williams sisters' domination of the Grand Slam has come to an end. Elder sister Venus has gone out of the French Open. Her third seed lost in straight sets to Vera Voronova. The 18-year-old Russian winning 2-6. 264 and former French Open champion Jennifer Capriati also lost to Russian Nadia Petrova. Juan Pablo Montoya won the Monaco Grand Prix this afternoon to give Williams their first victory in the Principality in 20 years. Kimi Raikkonen was second for McLaren and Ferrari's Michael Schumacher finished third. Raikkonen now leads the overall championship by four points ahead of Schumacher. There were 19 starters for the most glamorous fixture on the Grand Prix circuit. Jensen Button's accident in practice yesterday ruled him out, even though he wanted to race. 
Hans Harold Frensen was the first to make a mistake on the famous twists and turns on the Monte Carlo Street. The safety car was deployed on the first lap. What followed was a high-speed game of cat and mouse. Ralph Schumacher, Juan Pablo Montoya, Michael Schumacher and Kimi Räikkönen all took their place at the head of the procession through the Principality. With overtaking opportunities limited, most of the drama was to be found in the pit lane. The Renault mechanics beat McLaren in one duel to get truly back on the track ahead of last year's winner, David Coulthard. Neither came close to the podium, though. Williams' strategy, coupled with a supreme drive from Montoya, gave them a comfortable and long overdue win. With Räikkönen second and Michael Schumacher third, the championship is still anyone for the taking. Oli Foster, BBC News. And finally, one bit of golf news. Ian Poulter won the Wales Open at Celtic Manor. The Englishman finished 18 under par, three shots clear. That's all your sports. Darren. Maybe, thank you. Now, it's been a long and winding road, but Sir Paul McCartney is finally back in Liverpool tonight, doing what he does best. He's playing an emotional homecoming concert at the city's King's Dock. 35,000 ecstatic fans are there to watch. <laughs> on the weather now with Darren Beck. Thanks very much indeed Darren. We're seeing a thundery breakdown in the weather at the moment and the first day of June is definitely going out with a bang. Just take a look at this. Short time ago Shepshed in the East Midlands reported 39 millimetres of rain in just one hour. I've not known anything like this before. That storm quite localised looks as though it's following the M1. So for the next few hours the Met Office have issued a severe weather warning for Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire may well extend its way into parts of Yorkshire as well. Elsewhere, we're seeing some quite localised sharp showers in eastern parts of the UK, and we've also got cloud and patchy rain feeding in across western areas too. Now, as the night goes on, we see the worst of the showers steering away into the North Sea. This weather front is taking that cloud and patchy rain eastwards, but introducing a change. It's changed to much cooler and fresher conditions in the west, but still pretty muggy in the east. Now, for eastern areas, we'll probably start with a lot of clouds for tomorrow. Some patchy rain around here and there as well. Nothing quite as bad as we've got at the moment. It'll take all morning, but that cloud and rain should sneak away. And then brighter skies will follow across from the west with some sunshine and a scattering of showers. A few of them heavy in the west, particularly across Northern Ireland. It'll feel cooler, it'll feel fresher, more comfortable perhaps, but we're still looking at temperatures of 21 or 22 degrees. Through the rest of the week, it's a cooler and fresher feel, but rather changeable. Rain is gathering in the west, during Tuesday morning, that pushes its way eastwards pretty quickly during the afternoon. Brighter weather in the southwest later on. Darren. Darren, thank you very much. Now, a reminder of the main news tonight. The government has rejected accusations that it duped the country over Iran's weapons of mass destruction. Well, that's the latest. There'll be news throughout the night over on BBC News 24. But from us, good night.